Hey guys, thanks for tuning in to another episode of Without Parole Developer Interviews. Uh, with me this week is uh, Bjorn Sunason and Daniel Delabjork. Uh, these are two designers from Tarsier Studios, developers of Static. Gentlemen, how's the weather out there in Sweden today? Yeah, it, it, it looks brighter on the video than it actually is, I think. It's, it's yeah, a great nice sunny day. Yeah, no, this is like Swedish gray mm. winters. Swedish gray, is that a color in the Crayola box? <laughs> <laughs> Might be, yeah. Well, guys, thanks for, uh, thanks for taking the tam- time out and, uh, and talking to us a little bit today. Um, can, can you tell us a little bit about Tarsier and how, uh, how the studio came to be? Yeah, we, we started out with a, we were a bunch of people who just wanted to make games. We had studied at a game education, one of the first ones that existed in Sweden. Um, and we had huge dreams and aspirations of making things that were way over our heads. Uh, so, um, I, I, I could talk about this for like half an hour. So let's just say we we started working with Sony after a couple of years um, and made things for them together with Media Molecule. We worked a bunch on the Little Big Planet franchises um, and we worked on Tearaway unfolded and after churning out things that wasn't our own for many years we managed to get back to our own concepts and then we started making little nightmares and static which were our first two original games i i don't suppose uh i don't suppose anything's happening with and this is this is totally uh the most random question you'll get i swear during the entire interview uh what, what's happening with the city of metronome <laughs> Uh, nothing. It's 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 more like a, a seed of what the kind of things we were trying to do, I guess. We like to build this like weird, moody worlds, and uh, we. I mean, you you can see parts of that in Little Nightmares, I guess, and there's some meta layer parts of that in Static, uh, like how we relate to the the player and the, what they're doing when they're playing the game. Yeah, but the, as a concept, it's not something we're working on, and we haven't done anything with it for the last ten years or so. Okay, so not not a PlayStation VR two launch title is what you're trying to tell me. Uh, yeah, no. <laughs> yeah, I had to try. You never know; anything's possible. Yeah. So, what was the inspiration for Static then? There are so many things I could I could guess were inspirations for the game, uh, but I, but I'd rather just ask you what your inspirations actually were. Um, it always get a little bit fussy when you talk about inspirations for things because you, you don't always know where but it started out I, I'd love to take credit for it but it's not my idea it was our CEO actually we we had been working a lot with the doing weird things with the DualShock 4 back when we were working with Sony and trying to use that in different ways uh, so we had some concepts where we didn't just treat the gamepad as a gamepad. Yeah. And then the fallout of some of those things was he, he just came up with it. It was like, what if you actually like had the, the puzzle on your hands? Uh, like, what do you mean? It's like a puzzle that you try to solve. <laughs> and then, yeah, we talked about it. And we before we tried to come up with any of like the wrapping or the setting or what it was about, we just sat down and built a, a really terrible prototype without not not running in VR at all, just using the gyro, uh, piping it into a normal computer. Uh, so th- that was, it was a bit of like a rogue operation, I guess. I had some time. I had worked on the Little Nightmares prototype a bit, and then it was like between projects. So yeah, we s- sat down, got some art help, and just built that one puzzle, and then we figured out that it worked and then there was a couple of months where we tried to figure out the wrapping of it like what what is this why are you doing these puzzles um it actually started out as a as a horror setting because i guess yeah. that's where we go because <laughs> yeah that like the the saw type of of a thing which is kind of funny because you, you i've read like reddit threads where people are like oh it's static would work as a, like a really you have this scary thing that'll cut your hands off or whatever but um, 
and then that, that clashed really with the feeling of, whoa, you're sitting trying to solve a puzzle and you're like, you want to figure it out if you if there's fail states and time limits and the stress it it didn't feel like it would work for a whole a whole game like that <clears throat> and we also wanted to make something in VR where you had someone else with you um, in the room and it's it, I, I think a lot of Dr. Ingen came from the fact that it's it's really a lot of design decisions in static came about because it's really expensive to do things when you make games. It costs a lot if you want to have a character that reacts to you really realistically and the things you're doing and you can just the the fact that Dr. Inya sits and is like disinterested in you <laughs> and and it's a it's a bit like let you do that is it's it's a bit of a fallout from the the fact that making something that's super reactive is costly. And then, so instead of solving that problem, we design around it. Uh, and that, that's essentially a lot of the core of static, just not, not solving hard problems, working, with, working within the limitations of... It seems like you really lucked out then, because, uh, because his disinterest in you does make you... Makes, you almost feel disappointed that you're not solving the puzzles faster. You're like, oh man, I'm really like screwing this up. This guy's like just not not even paying attention to what I'm doing. Like you're supposed to be the subject of his test, and he just doesn't even care. Um, and so it does it does kind of feel like there's a time limit, even though there's not, because you're like, oh man, I gotta I gotta do this. This guy is like so disappointed in me. Uh, so I, I actually like I actually like the way that came out quite a bit. Yeah, I, th I think Dave, who wrote all the dialogue and the story, really took took that thing and like pushed that character into interesting places. You know, he is a cliché scientist, in a way. This, this is not like the world's most amazing character when you look at him. But the fact that he is a cliché scientist means that we can just... Okay, now people understand what, what he is as a baseline. He's like the stereotype. Now we can make, we can make him really interesting and figure out who, who is this guy, really. Do, do you take any offense when people... Uh... Like maybe reference Half Life or uh, Portal Aperture Labs when they when they talk about static. No, th those are awesome <laughs> games, and I <laughs> right. Yeah, uh, and yeah. Also, the the fact like I was talking about how it started out as a horror game. The, the fact that we yeah the test subject that also that's also a trope. It, but it it allows us to build puzzles that they don't need to like contextually work in a in a world and make sense. Yeah, so you can, you can also take something and make it different and interesting enough without, yeah, without trying to solve other hard problems. Yeah, um, and I, I feel like we we figured figured out a way to do it where it kind of stands out and stands on its own. I, I've got to ask. Uh, um, when I was playing today, the Dual Shock Four felt really, really good. Uh, and I know a lot of times when you play a PlayStation VR game, uh, it with the DualShock 4, it depends. Your your camera placement has a lot to do with how well you're tracking, uh, how how well the tracking works. Um, you know, usually move, when we usually recommend people put their uh, put their camera up pretty high, you know, almost like six feet tall or so, roughly, and kind of pointing down at your play space. Uh, but that doesn't work so well with games like Moss when you're using the DualShock 4 and you're, you're kind of moving it around in a 3D space. But I, I didn't have any issue with that today with static at all. In fact, it was very, very responsive and, and the tracking was perfect. So I've got to ask, um, is it using that light bar on the DualShock 4 at all? Or is it is it all just the gyroscopes? Yeah, no, it, it's it's using the the light bar for all the positional stuff. That's what, the, the, I'm more surprised that it worked rather than being able to take credit for it working. <laughs> Cause, but that that is so one of humble. the things. I mean, when you when you finish a game, there's always a lot of tiny things you wish you would have done, or huge things if you're unlucky. But uh, one of the things that we did that I sad we didn't get into the game properly is like detecting when the player has the camera too high up and telling them that the tracking might get wonky because you can't actually see the light from the angle. So. Uh, so what happens between the levels then? It, it, suddenly you go from this thing where like it's it's so totally immersive and you're in, and you feel like your hands are inside this box, and then suddenly you're uh, you're kind of doing this entirely separate puzzle where you're you know connecting lines to underwater segments, um, and and that feels that feels like almost like a t an entirely different game. Uh, was that by design? 
Um, I mean, the, 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 this is like sp spoiler territory, oh, and, sure. I, and, and it's all, it's also like the, we built the game a lot to be up to people's interpretation, what is going on, okay. um, and I think there's still some people on the team who disagree with the official version that everyone else agrees on. <laughs> um, yeah, but, but but yeah, I mean the the game plays with the idea of who who are you as a player when you're playing because you're sitting with a weird thing on your head with that strange thing in your hands, and in the game there's a character that's doing this, and if you play the game to the end there's like we start fucking with that idea I guess can I swear on this? Oh, I swear as much as you fucking want. Oh, okay. <laughs> um, but um, so yeah, I I don't know if we should like make a separate spoiler thing or I don't think Dave, who who's story responsible, would like us to to spoil too much of uh, what is what. Yeah, we don't. We don't. We don't want to spoil anything. I, I I've, I've noticed that a lot of people who are watching these developer interviews, uh, these these are the videos that make them interested in the game in the first place. You know, they're like, oh, you know, I wasn't interested in this particular game, but once once I listened to the developers talk about it, then I was like, oh, I'm gonna give it a shot. So yeah, we don't want to ruin it for anybody. That's for sure. But I I, uh, I, I can talk a little bit about where that came from. Uh, these we call them the interludes in, when we were working on them. It's. Uh, we the first like pre-production version of the game we were making, we were trying to tell a really complex story, um, and the doctor was really talking a lot during the puzzles, um, which turned out it was super annoying. You you were just sitting there like I want to solve this, just shut up. <laughs> which like we kept a little of that annoying part because it's there's something nice about it, but um, so they are they are there as a. Both they have a meaning in the game, like what, what does it lead to when you after you solve a puzzle, there's things happening in there that has meaning, and the final things you do in there and the final level ties that together, um, and it allows us to to tell more of the world in a way where players can like just listen in and hear what Doctor Ingen is like when he's leaving messages and talking to other characters, characters I can call them. Yeah. Um, so, it yeah, it's it's a nice space to allow players to just solve more puzzles or like partake in the story if they want to. And I, I, this is a question. Uh, De Des really wanted to be here for this interview. Uh, in in fact, this interview almost happened with Des, but uh, but he had a snow day today and his kids are home. Um, so uh, so he was he was really curious about the polygraph tests when you're entering happy or sad, etc. Um, and he's, he was wondering, again, if this is spoiler territory, then uh, please let me know. But do, do the answers you make to the polygraph test, uh, do, do they make a difference? Or is it just to kind of add a little extra flair, a little extra immersion to the experience? Do we say? <laughs> well, well I, um, so, yes or no? Yeah, yeah to, to <laughs> spill it. Sure. Well, they don't actually mean anything. They don't actually do anything. But uh, the idea is that when you sit there in the immersed in the game, you think they do, and that means something. So it doesn't really, in the end, I mean, it's disappointing to hear that it doesn't mean anything. Uh, but when you are in there and you think it means something, hopefully it had an impact on how, how you answered. And that uh, I think that is enough, in a way. I, I think you can think of them as, as cutscenes in a sense that it's something that you watch and interact with, it doesn't change the outcome of anything. Uh, in the same way as watching a cutscene in a, like, a different game, it's a, it's a way for us to tell more of the story, which maybe we did too vaguely. I think a bunch of people who play the game think it doesn't make any sense at all, and that, that's fine, because I can see how people can react to it like that. Yeah. But then th th there's also a like production <clears throat> reality to it that we started out with the goals of them having a more visible effect in the game not not as like branching levels and different endings and stuff like that but you know, use the results a bit more which we sadly didn't have time to do but uh, they are important for the the story of the game 
and for the doctor, he needs those results. The uh, the mul the multiplayer component of this game, uh, when when you use the companion app uh, and you play with somebody else in the room, uh, I I feel like this really throws throws me for a loop because uh, experimenting is is sort of the name of the game. You know, every single time you sit in a new level, you're you I get this I get this air of confidence about me every time I solve a puzzle in static where I'm like oh I figured it out I got the hang of it oh great I'm ready for the next puzzle and then it's like back to square one every single time a new puzzle starts I'm like oh I, I take it all back I didn't learn a thing because I don't know what any of these buttons do anymore but the multiplayer I think adds an extra level of of stress to the entire situation because you don't feel like you have that sense of freedom that that time to experiment when you get somebody sitting there with you because you're like i don't not only do i not know what i'm doing but i have to communicate with somebody else um which which just made it probably the toughest puzzles for me uh, is that is that something you hear from anybody else did you guys find it to be tough to develop or tough to solve or did your play testers find it tough to solve that was a big question there were a lot of words in there. Do, do, donil did most of the work on the multiplayer puzzles mm -hmm. so uh, I um, definitely they thought that those puzzles were more difficult, um, but that was kind of the point as well. We wanted them to be difficult. Um, I mean, you you have I think, yeah, you might feel more stressed, but I think you also have a higher tolerance before you drop out when you when you're when there's two of you and you're talking about stuff. Yeah, if you're if you're all alone and you get get stuck for like, yeah, people have different th thresholds. Like, at what point do I give up? And when you wanna you wanna go far up that, but not too far, because then it gets just annoying. Uh, whereas with multiplayer, I think people have a higher, yeah, it's like no, we we can do this. Let's go through it again, and people can help each other out, figuring stuff out. And yeah, I. I think stressful is fine, and I think the multiplayer thing is something people find and try once they play the normal game. Um, but yeah, we didn't play test the multiplayer puzzles as much as we did the normal puzzles, because it, it was we yeah they were a little bit of an extra that we really wanted to do, but we could we couldn't really afford. We wanted to have more of them in there, but we didn't have time. Well, on topic. Um well, Shell Games just announced recently that that they're uh, bringing DLC to I Expect You to Die, which is uh, which is which has been around for about the same amount of time your game has. Uh, is there is there any talk about bringing DLC to Static? It just seems like a, a perfect fit. Um, we we have a design, uh, I guess, for for a DLC that would be super cool to make. Like an initial paper idea and really, yeah, switching around players' expectations of what stuff is. But it's one of those like economic realities that it doesn't seem like it would make sense uh, to actually do it unless we charge way too much for it, and then it'll be a hard hard buy for people. So that, that's just one of those sad realities. We we'd love to do it, and we we might still get a chance to do it at some. Um, but right now we are not working on it actively. Okay, um, it's 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 kind of it's a shame to hear because uh, you know obviously um, you know this is this is a game that I think anytime Static gets brought up, that's it's what people always want to hear more of. The, is is there a sequel in the works? Is there DLC coming? Um, and uh, and and obviously, yeah, we you know. I, I think I think Shell Games is in a unique position where they can bring free DLC. Um, I, I I'd be very very happy to pay for a static DLC if you ever decide to bring it out. Did 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 Sony fund this project, or or was this a, this was completely an independent Tarsier Studios thing? The Static was funded by a division in Sony called Strategic Content. Um, we worked with the Ben Andak from over there. Yeah. And uh, so it's actually it's published by us, but it was funded by them. Okay. Um, so and strategic, is actually the the division that made sure a lot of really good indie titles and smaller weirder games are available on the PS4. Um, 
and they were yeah they've done a really good job with figuring out things like that and they're they were super cool to work with and it, so this is the reason obviously why we haven't seen static on any other platform it's a psvr exclusive uh it's actually we could bring it to other platforms like there, there's no like legal uh, red tape kind of thing hindering that but it's the fact that no other platform has uh, like trackable gamepad oh yeah which means that we we'd have to redesign it for for using uh, vive or oculus controllers for instance um and that's something we have talked about and looked at, and but it, everything feels like it would be a little bit tacked on. Maybe we can, maybe we'll figure out a solution for it in the future, or maybe a tracked gamepad comes out on another system and we can just port it. Um, uh, did you guys? Uh, are, are, you, are you able to talk about sales at all? This this launched uh, almost two years ago for twenty dollars. Did uh, obviously the PlayStation VR community was pretty i mean really small then but it's grown quite a bit uh, have, you, have you guys seen sales grow with the growth of the community yeah the, the game is still is still selling i mean we put it on sale a lot because yeah people we, we want people to buy it and it is a it is a bit of a niche niche game um so i we're not allowed to talk about the actual numbers yeah but i think it, it makes us super happy when we see threads on forums of, of people going like, hey, Static is on sale, you should play it, and then people see that, and I think that kind of word of mouth really helps uh, to drive things, because we don't have much marketing budget to try and get people to find the game, essentially. Yeah, I mean, we, we've obviously put Static in every single top 20 list, uh, top 20 PlayStation VR list since it came out. Um, we're, we're huge fans of it over here. In case anybody's watching this and hasn't watched our reviews or our episode of Why We Love PSVR about it or hasn't watched our top 20 list, um, we always consider this one of the must-have games for PlayStation VR. And even uh, and even the sale that's going on right now, you know, I, I made a short list uh, on a breaking news report. Uh, a short list of games that you need to have uh, that are going on in the sale right now. And this is currently $6 for PlayStation Plus members. Uh, so, I mean, pretty ridiculous if you don't own this at this point. Um, you guys you guys must see huge spikes uh, in sales whenever whenever it goes on sale. I mean, $6 is, is a ludicrous price for this. Um, I guess huge, huge spikes. <laughs> it's hard to say what, what's huge. Yeah, we, we see spikes, definitely. Uh, so th this is actually the first time uh, that we've a I've actually opened up the floor to some of our viewers for for uh, for, for questions. So uh, so I've got a question from Nixus24. He said, "This is this is one of the only puzzle games I've played where you get zero guidance. It's refreshing to not have my hand held. But was there any temptation to give instructions or hints to the player?" All the time. I know when we when we. Uh, made the game, we tested it a lot on the people who work here and uh, at some point the, the CEO at the time, he came up to me and asked me how am I not frustrated looking at the, when people play it because you sit there and you, you made a puzzle and you think it's obvious, or not obvious, you know it's a puzzle but you think it's going to be this and this difficult and it turns out to be sometimes way more difficult um, and it can be very frustrating to sit there and just accept that they are lost right now. But if you give them a little bit of time, sometimes it clicks. Uh, like just put it on the threshold of they are just about to start screaming, but not quite. And then they figure it out. And that feeling you get when, when you have been super frustrated and just figures out can be very rewarding. So yes, it, it was very frustrating at times to watch people like to, to yeah be lost yeah yeah I'm, I'm i'm one of those people like it doesn't matter what kind of puzzle game it is you know it could be a point and click adventure it could be one of these it could be it could be anything uh and i will i will struggle until the absolute last minute but you're absolutely right i i almost feel like the more time you spend trying to figure out a puzzle the more rewarding it is 
once you finally do. So I, 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 I'm, I... And we did obviously adjust the, the difficulty of most of the puzzles to some like extent, make them easier or harder. I think we made most of the things easier, um, but I guess we did make stuff harder at some point as well. Yeah, I think it, yeah, it's a hard balance that in the end you, yeah, you go with your gut feeling because people get stuck at different things all the time. There's some spikes in there that I wish we would, could have like filed down a little bit. Um, but regarding hints, also like up until maybe two thirds into the production, we had a plan for a kind of a button display system to like show. Because what it's one thing about people not getting the puzzles, which is fine. Like, but when when people forget that like the D pad exists, then it's it's not gonna they're not gonna feel smart when they find the D pad. Instead, they're <laughs> gonna feel stupid, which is not you want them to feel smart when they figure it out. But once it's like, oh, the D pad was there. God, I'm the moron. So we yeah we had a plan for a way to just display that you have buttons that are connected to things. But we ended up not implementing that properly because we didn't need to. The the playthrough showed that, uh, yeah, it worked. I'm I'm glad you didn't because uh, again, even I've played through this game two full times now, and and definitely you know a few capturing gameplay footage for different videos and stuff I've dropped in uh, a, a few times over the last two years. Um, but, but today, just again, when I was refreshing my memory, uh, I, I, I was like, I'm just going to start with the first puzzle and, uh, and see how far I get, you know, over the course of an hour. And, uh, and, and that's, ex and that's exactly what happened to me. I didn't forget that there was a D pad there, but I did forget that I had an L1 and R1 button. Like I was pushing L2 and R2, but just totally forgot because when you look down, you're not seeing a controller, you're seeing your hands inside of this box. Um, so, so you're not, I can, I can understand why people might not think about a D pad being there because that's not what you think your hands are in when you look down in virtual reality. So I totally get it, but I'm also glad that you didn't you know, uh, implement a hint system at all. So how long do we have until, uh, until, we, hear what, until we hear what Tarsier is working on next? Are we gonna be hearing any announcements uh, soon, I hope? Um, I don't think I can say. It's usually not up to us. It's more up to the people we work with. Yeah, okay. so I, I, it's better that I'm quiet right now. We are working on some pretty cool stuff, I think. I, and I'm hopefully sure other are. people will also once we get it out there. And obviously you can't tell if it's, tell us if it's VR related or not. Um, but it, but I mean, I'm, I'm assuming that, uh, that, that Static being your first VR project is... Uh, I, I, I hope that you guys fell in love with PlayStation VR uh, and VR in general as much as I did playing your game uh, and, and I really really hope that we see more VR projects from you in the future you don't have to respond to that <laughs> I don't want to get anyone in trouble I just want to say thank you for making your game thank you well I think we all had a I think it was really cool for everyone in the team to get to try and like work with new something just completely different from what we've done before and I think VR has so much potential for more interesting things i mean there's there's people doing really cool things but i think there's like the space the design space to explore there is is really large and it'd be it'd be cool to do more stuff there yeah well gentlemen thank you very very much for your time uh i can't cannot wait to see what uh Tarsier brings us next uh, and uh, and I, I'll be honest, I, I can't. I actually can't wait to go back and play a little bit more Static today. Once I dip my toes back in, I, I just <laughs> I just want to play through the whole thing again. So, thank you so much again for your time. Thank you for thank you. Uh, having us. And uh, buy Static, please. <laughs> <laughs> Everyone, buy Static, please. See you guys. All right, bye. All right, you guys, that does it for another developer interview here at Without Parole. I want to thank Daniel and Bjorn and everyone over at Tarsier for accommodating our schedule. And we're not blowing smoke. Static really is one of the best PlayStation VR games out there, so make sure you grab it now. And I apologize, because that question about DLC, that came from Texatron, so I apologize for not giving you credit. All right, guys, well, we'll see you next Saturday for another developer interview. <laughs>